And the first topic we're going to be dealing with relates to generally the topic of uh, liability of trustees and uh, specifically the uh, amendments that have been made to the Trustee Act and uh, the effect that they have upon the issues uh, relating to liability of trustees. And Ian Hull is going to uh, present uh, a paper to us in this regard. And I can tell you, first off, it is not Ian Hull's birthday today, so we don't have to go through that again. And Ian's greatest claim to fame, as far as I'm concerned, is that his personality is nothing like his father's. <laughs> Ian is actually reasonable, and you can get along with him, and he's very easy to deal with. And I'm looking at Rodney as I'm saying this. Um, in addition to that, Ian's not only a fine litigator, but Ian contributes incredible amounts of his time to teaching and writing uh, in this field of uh, estates and trusts. And uh, this area of major change with respect to the uh, Trustee Act was something that uh, we very importantly wanted dealt with uh, this year. And uh, we were confident that there was nobody who could better attack the subject uh, than Ian. And I've had a chance to read most of his paper and uh, I think you'll find it to be uh, an excellent uh, guide with respect to the changes that have now been made and the effect that they're going to have with respect to trustees' liability. And as no doubt Ian will get into, you'll see that he has uh, examined or at least canvassed the American situation where some of the states have had this prudent investor rule uh, for some time. So now I'll uh, turn the platform over to Ian Hull. Thank you very much, Brian. Well, just get set up here. I, uh, I understand that I missed this morning's uh, talk with my father, and I understand that there was a, it was a real sleeper. <laughs> I blame it on the fact that he had a more interesting topic, so if I'm not quite as entertaining. I was dealing with one of his wayward grandchildren, which I blame him for, my son, and uh, couldn't be here to hear him. However, I want to turn now and... <clears throat> There's sort of three topic areas that I want to try to cover. And given the time involved, I'm going to focus on two a little more than on the third. I'm going to just briefly deal with the exercise of discretion. That's for two reasons. One is I, uh, I, I think it's probably uh, an offshoot of what I want to talk primarily about. And second of all, I'm just a little shaken up by having Mr. Justice Cullity to my left and uh, having regard to the fact that he's written everything on that question, I'm, uh, I'm not prepared to comment on it other than what I'll briefly state. So starting with uh, the three topic areas I want to talk a little bit about is the accounting and the trustee liability in that respect in the context of what is now called the prudent investor rule. Second of all, the Trustee Act amendments, and I'm going to try to go through specifically the amendments, and in particular, uh, I've got an illustration of how I think a court might uh, approach a uh, a fairly unique uh, question in this context. And then thirdly, uh, I may have, if I have time, some comments on the exercise of discretion, which I deal with in my paper briefly. And Catching all <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's super. Thank you. <laughs> that was a lot easier than fixing the computer. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> just turning to the question of accounting, and I think as I, as I work through this problem and, and try to address the new amendments to the Trustee Act, the fundamentals and the foundations, in my view, come from the accounting and the audit process. Where an accounting, in accounting circumstances or the audit, the question of what's expected of you and how you will be judged and what the standard of care is something that is well entrenched and the process upon which and the guidelines and the, and the steps that the court will take in, in determining and judging you is fairly well entrenched. You've got a duty to account. 
It's a fiduciary's duty to account. There's no question about it. The duties and obligations, such as keeping proper records, keeping vouchers, keeping beneficiaries advised, if those things aren't being maintained, you're going to be susceptible to liability. As a trustee, I'm, I'm mindful of Section 48 of the Estates Act, which sets out the duty of an executor to account. Mindful of Section 49 of the Estates Act, which gives about as broad of language that you'd want in respect of the, the nature of inquiry that can be made for, at a, during an audit. And you can make a full inquiry in Section 49, says make a full inquiry concerning the whole of the property and inquire into any complaint. And that kind of language is uh, what makes me as a trustee pretty nervous and pretty cautious. Contrasting that with Section 42 of the Substitute Decisions Act and my liability as a guardian or a fiduciary in that capacity, I look at the power of the court to order the accounting, the wide spectrum of who can compel the accounting. The, accounting. the standing question is, uh, is, is very broad, and the powers of the court, again, are broad. In the context of an accounting, you're uh, faced with what in Whittefield's uh, text refers to as maladministration. Well, these are the damages that are going to flow as a result of your uh, incompetence or your mistakes. And they look at uh, issues of, uh, and I deal with in the paper briefly, the question of surcharge and falsification. A surcharge order where the court will, ele where an allegation is that there's an omission for which there ought to be a credit, uh, such as a missing uh, bank account. Falsification, where an item on the debit side is alleged to be either wholly false or erroneous, and sometimes that falls into the category of the question of legal fees. So the common areas of criticisms in the context of the audit are tied right into the new prudent investor rule. And it's historically been to look at things like improper mixes of capital and income, speculative uh, investments, not maintaining the value of the capital, not considering income tax liability, unnecessary delays, or failure to disclose breaches of trust. So with these common areas of criticism, you're faced with what kind of exposure am I looking at when this audit occurs? And now I want to turn briefly to what the Trustee Act amendments are. But the nice and the comforting aspect of an audit, of course, is, is that it is a final statement of the affairs, and it's conclusive in respect of your conduct. So if you can get through the audit and you can get the judge to sign the order, you're off to the races. What are the Trustee Act amendments? Well, there's three aspects I want to talk about. First of all, in the context of how will you be judged, the first question is what are the amendments specifically? What is this new standard of care? What relief from liability now exists? The second question is what is this prudent investor rule? What are the courts saying or what, what have the courts said in the past in different jurisdictions and what can we expect the court to say in the future? And as I say, bringing all of that in in the context of an example of how um, the prudent investor rule may or may not work. So what are the amendments? Well, I deal with them. They're in a schedule to my paper. It's the uh, version that came out just before the amendments were proclaimed. And so it's, it shows them as proposed. But they're in there, and you've got the language. And I don't intend to, by any means, go through that in any specific way. But the new standard of care is set out. There's a definition there. The, the language is broader. There is more flexibility of being attached to it. For example, we can delegate. And we heard from Lori Redden this morning, we, can, we should be very mindful of diversifying our assets, but maybe not compelled to diversify. We have to consider whether or not we're going to seek investment advice. So specifically, how are we going to be judged? In this codified world, where Section 27, and that's really the one section that you have to go to, in my view, to really get a handle on what the new changes are, how are we going to be judged? Well, the first step is, as always, look at the trust document. What are we dealing with? Previously, if the trust document didn't provide broad investment authority, you went to the legal list, that comfortable list that some of us would use and rely on. Now, in investing in trust property, the trustee must exercise, and this is the kind of language that we're faced with, the trustee must exercise the care, skill, diligence, and judgment 
that a prudent investor exercise in the making of investments. Well, that's nice, flowery, good old-fashioned drafting language that puts us all into a warm feeling as lawyers and gives us really not a whole lot of guidance in respect of what the court's going to expect, in my view. So we've got to go to the second step, and that is go to the criteria. And Section 27.5 sets out the criteria. And it's a, it's a unique way of proposing it and a unique way of setting the, uh, the parameters out in respect of, in the United States anyway, in the jurisdictions in the United States, this kind of five or six point uh, approach has never been as uh, is, is, is embraced as it is now in Ontario. But it really is just summarizing what the courts have consistently been doing, in my view, for about 100 years in assessing what this whole prudent investor rule means. So the criteria specifically is, you know, look at the general economic conditions, inflation and deflation considerations, tax consequences, as I said earlier, these are some of these things are overlapping into what have been the traditional areas of inquiry. The role of the investment within the whole portfolio, return from income and growth on capital, balance, liquidity, and the last one, an asset special relationship, which is an interesting uh, and an important uh, qualification because if you do have a trust which has an asset in it that may not be a conventionally uh, uh, invested in maybe a family cottage or something of that nature, you're, the, the Act anticipates that that may exist and, and gives you uh, some rights to uh, and flexibility with respect to that, that investment. The third step is let's look at the new rules. What are the, what are the rules? And I use the word new rules, and that's probably not accurate. These rules have been out there for a long time, but section, these amendments have really brought this all in. As has been said earlier this morning, any form of property can be invested in. Mutual funds, that's the glamorous one. Everybody's heard about that. We can now invest in mutual funds. Common trust funds, the trust companies' trust funds, that's another area where we can invest in. The question of diversification, as I mentioned earlier, is, a, is, is clearly front and center, and it is a rule, and it is something that we have to, I, I, as a trustee, I'm going to be mindful of, of the expectation that in the right circumstances, you should be probably diversifying. And the last is investment advice. And whether or not there's a, a requirement to get investment advice or not, it's clearly identified as something as a, in, in the new uh, provisions, and in my example, I work through how I think that investment advice is going to be and what the expectations are with respect to that investment advice. So let's just turn the corner briefly for a minute on the question of relief from liability. We're up on a pedestal here. We have all of these uh, expectations. We have a new standard of care, a standard of care that, that as the trustee I'm looking at, I'm thinking this is a higher standard of care than it was before July 1st, 1999. And if that's the case, what kind of protections have been built in? Because we're not all perfect and mistakes are going to happen. Well, there's three aspects to the protections and the relief from liability. The first is Section 28, which talks about a trustee not being liable if you acted reasonably and you had a plan. Well, acting reasonably, I'm a simple person. That never really helps me in any case. But Having a plan, I think, is really where you can close your hand on what some of the real core expectations are. And that plan is that what you've done and, in my view, what you've documented you've done to arrange the investment portfolio. The second aspect is Section 29. It says, the court will assess damages on the overall performance of the trust as opposed to the individual isolated entries in the sense that if I buy a BREX but I've also bought BCE and the, at the end of the day the return's not so bad, that has to be a consideration of the court. Now I'm not sure that you're still going to get away with the BREX purchase but having said that, the, the, we, we at least have that direction and the, and the Act is saying, and that's the important distinction, the Act is saying let's look at the overall performance. Section 35 though has been twisted a little and I think has taken, uh, put some more exposure on my lap in respect of liability. Before Section 35 of the Trustee Act dealt with the ability to be relieved from a technical breach of trust. Now Section 35 sub 2 says you can't be protected from a technical breach of trust when investing. 
And if you walk through that scenario from a practical standpoint, a lot of the time you're going to be looking for relief from a technical breach of trust is in the context of the investment decisions or the, the conduct that you undertook as in, in the investment context. So in my view, I think they've watered down Section 35, given us a little bit more flexibility and a little more uh, uh, comfort because they're going to assess the overall performance of the, the trust, but uh, it's a balancing act. And it's a balancing act that I think helps, I, for me, I, it crystallizes for me a little easier if I look at what other expectations are out there, statutory expectations are out there. And if you compare the Relief from Liability and the Trustee Act as opposed to the Substitute Decisions Act, you get a feeling for where the Trustee Act is going to fall in, I think. And I, I find that if you look at the course, the Substitute Decisions Act is a floating standard. If you're going to take compensation, you're put to a higher standard, you're at higher expectations if you're a guardian of property under the Substitute Decisions Act. If you don't take compensation, the Act says you're not as expected to be, uh, the, the standard of care is not expected to be as high. We'll compare, and, and then the trustee, and the Substitute Decision Act goes one step further and says clearly section 32 sub 12 of the Substitute Decision Act says the Trustee Act does not apply. It's not on the page. You can't come to us with anything in respect to the Trustee Act if you're acting as a guardian. So <clears throat> under the Substitute Decision Act, they have created their own framework for relief from liability. There's obviously the fi fundamental principle that a guardian of property is liable for damages resulting from a breach of a guardian's duties. But the relief from liability in this in the Substitute Decisions Act is interesting because it says that under Section 33 sub 2, if the court is satisfied that a guardian of property who has committed a breach of duty has nevertheless acted honestly, reasonably, and diligently, it may relieve the guardian from all or part of the liability. So the Substitute Decisions Act is giving us some more flexibility, and, and it's an elastic band. Who knows how far you're going to stretch it? And in the context of the, uh, the Substitute Decision Act, um, when you balance that against the Trustee Act, it's going to be interesting to see how the court, and, and again, the, trust, the Substitute Decisions Act, you're not to look to the Trustee Act, but maybe the court will have some view and some consideration as to what other statutory uh, parameters are out there in relief from liability. So what is the prudent investor rule? Well, who knows? <laughs> uh, it's, it seems to be a combination. Uh, there's a statute, section 27, as I've talked about, number one. Number two, it's part of what is called the prudent man rule, which is a rule that was established in the United States that came out of the restatement on trust second uh, and prior to that came out of the case law back, all, dating back to the early 1900s. And it's still in the rule in many states. Many states, for example, New York State has just brought in the prudent investor rule effective in 1995, but there are still some states out there that follow the prudent man rule. The distinction is important because when you're looking at the cases, Many of the cases are helpful that relate, that refer to the prudent man rule in the United States, but the big difference is the prudent man rule looks at the standard of care applicable to every, each and every investment choice on an isolated basis versus the prudent investor rule, which says take a global approach to the investment strategy. So that distinction should be kept in mind when you're reading the cases down in, from the states and certainly historically from the states. Because of that difference, there are going to be different approaches. But that's not to say that the prudent man rule, and that's a name that was created uh, uh, in the early, in the, well, in the late 50s, um, that the parameters are not going to be applicable still today. Because in my view, I think they are. I just want to take a minute and just talk a few, briefly about the US experience. And I tried in my paper to set out some summaries and some analysis from the case laws in the United States to uh, give a feel and a flavor for what the United States anyway, some of the cases in the states have done, and the courts in the states have done. The US experience is founded on sort of the case law, the restatement second, and then the restatement third, which came out in 1990. And what what they have all done in many more volumes and many more pages uh, have done is, is more or less done what the Trustee Act, Section 27, Sub 5, is condensed into uh, point form. And that is they've said to look at contemporary financial practices, 
get the highest return and given the lowest risk. And that kind of language is, is throughout the, uh, the restatement and the cases. It's the sort of the buy high, sell low approach to my investment pro portfolio, which is criticized. Um, effectively diversify. Don't just diversify because you think you have to. There, there has to be a, a certain uh, sophistication brought to the question of diversification. Limiting costs. Look at the settlers' intention. Were they considered? What are the beneficiaries? Are there, are there certain uh, personal circumstances that should be considered? Are there unascertained beneficiaries? What if there are conflicting uh, interests amongst them? The kind of basic questions you would want to ask. But it's clear that it comes down to conduct and not the final results, which the courts in the United States have clearly said matters. The trustee is not an insurer nor a guarantor of the trust assets. So if it's the conduct that matters, there's two aspects of that. Well, in my view, I think I better document my conduct. And I better have a file that reviews in writing, memos to file, however you want to do it, the kinds of considerations I undertook. Second of all, the conduct is going to have this umbrella, the overlay over uh, the question of conduct is the common law duties of a trustee. And of course, we can't ever leave those duties behind. They are, we have to be mindful of that. And the duties, such as the duty of impartiality, the duty of loyalty, prudence, not the duty not to delegate, which is modified by the Trustee Act to a certain extent, the duty not to benefit from the trust. So the common law duties sort of over, uh, are an overlay in respect to the considerations. So I just want to now turn for a minute about uh, with an example. And, and I, I, I thought about this because in Ontario, certainly, you're not going to find a reported decision that takes us very far. It, the, the changes became place, it came into place in, on July 1st, 1999. So we're not going to have a specific reported decision. So I thought I'd, I'd just take a minute and go through what uh, the kind of analysis that may be used in respect of uh, one of these questions. And my example is the duty to limit costs. Because as we've come into the new prudent investor rule, and I've said in my view anyway, it's a higher standard. Well, maybe in the old days I could have got away with and ignored a couple of these judges and said, well, I'll buy a mutual fund. But I got a good return. Nobody's going to ask any questions. And they're talking about changing the act anyway. I'll get away with it. And they did. And they went and audited the accounts. And there wasn't uh, uh, you know, a, a screaming and yelling about, about the investment strategy. Well, in my view, I think the prudent investor rule could create a second level and a higher level of consideration. And that is, what about the costs of managing the money? And because it's now going to be much more uh, rampant in terms of the choice of going to mutual funds, presumably, or the choice of that kind of delegation, the cost issue and the cost controls, I think, may play a role. Because they obviously play a role and a critical role in the management of wealth. Everybody knows that if you're managing your own personal affairs. You're, you're buying your stocks over the internet if you can do it and you, and you want to do it, is to save a commission than going to a straight broker. Well, the courts are going to be looking at the kind of cost analysis that the prudent investor undertook in respect of his or her management of the, uh, the, 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 the investments. It's more than just low fees and commissions, but I think that is going to be an easy hit. And it's going to be an area where if you're going to want to take, a, if, you're going to, if I'm going to be invest, investing someone's money on the, on, in the context of a trust, I'm going to want to be careful that I've managed that question. And I've, I've con I've, I have a course of conduct that I can follow through. And not just a blindly, I bought the latest Altamira fund and it went up 20% a year and nobody asks any questions. The US experience is that the good performance doesn't justify inappropriately high fees. And, the, uh, and there is authority in the United States where they, the courts will go and take a two-prong approach to it. They'll evaluate the, the performance, for sure, as a prudent investor. And then they'll evaluate the costs. And they won't necessarily justify the costs on, on, in a circumstance where there, where, there, there are high, where there is good performance. So the trustee's duty, and coming back to the common law duty, you have a duty to avoid unnecessary and unreasonable inappropriate costs. So in going through this analysis, I typically want to look to the United States experience because there's such a vast amount of information down there and a vast amount of decisions. And the second restatement itself even mandates that, of course, you have to exercise what they say, reasonable care and skill. 
So in my course of conduct in this, in this cost analysis, I say, well, a trustee can incur expenses, and they can incur reasonable expenses. And it'll be up to the courts to, to finally, or, or to give us a more definitive view on expenses and costs. But uh, I think we have a hint from Madam Justice Haley. I believe it was her decision to read Miller that where the investment uh, advice was uh, something that was an additional cost pre-prudent investor rule and, and was not uh, uh, deducted from compensation. But the costs have to be reasonable, and they have to be reasonable in relation to the assets and the overall investment strategy. And I think I better be careful that I've exercised this reasonable caution and care, and I've done so by obtaining expert advice. Well, the obtaining of expert advice in and of itself can create its own problems. There is a natural tendency to want to hire your, your next door neighbor or your brother-in-law who's just gone into the business. The problem is, of course, the selection of the advisor is a key decision, and it comes back to the conduct, and it comes back to the plan. And when someone's going to qu question you or cr try to criticize your conduct or your plan, they're going to want to know why you chose that specific investment advisor, regardless of the results. Because if, for example, the, the return was great, but the costs are out of whack, you may be subject to some criticism. So when you're choosing the advisor, you want to be careful that you've extensively considered the individual or the group or the management group or the trust company. Uh, you want to, I, would, I would want to make sure that this particular advisor has got the skill, has got the, the expertise, and that, the, and that the investment advisor is unbiased and can provide a critical examination of the asset management. So if you look at, uh, in the United States again, the mutual fund experience, and there's, there's all kinds of materials written about returns, and I, by no means, and I chose to stay out of this profession for a reason I can't count, but the investment world, you can write, read about something in returns on investments every day. And, I'm not sure that uh, you know how helpful or how harmful that's going to be, and what kind of expectations there are going to be of the courts, to, of, uh, of of the trustees. But an interesting article I read from the Journal of Financial Planning. It was in April 1998. They did a statistical analysis, and they concluded that the higher expenses in, in the mutual funds, in uh, they, the characteristics of mutual funds, the higher the expense, the lower the relative performance. They looked at no load funds and load funds. They looked at turnover ratios. I never heard of that before in my life, and I probably own a mutual fund for a couple of years now. Uh, not a big one, but one that uh, I've never thought of what a turnover ratio is. But what it illustrates is what kind of expectations am I, as the prudent investor, going to be put to when analyzing my costs at the end of the day? Is someone going to say to me, well, why you buy, why'd you buy a no load fund, or why did you buy a load fund? Those kinds of questions and that kind of expertise, I think, are questions that may get raised and they may be brought to the forefront and it, and, and, it, and it helps illustrate in my view where this could move. And if we have a bar that's been inched forward and inched up, I don't think it's going to go down. I mean, we're going to be looking further and further down the road at higher and higher expectations. So the prudent investor in, in, in the mutual fund example uh, is just one of, of many that are out there. And I guess in, in sort of summary, what I was very sort of taken back by and, and pleased to hear was the comments of Lori Redden and, and uh, Diane Caldwell this morning because it gives you a flavor of what, as a, as a trustee, I'm expecting out there. And they're the first line of attack. Don't kid yourself. They're there to, before the court can even get at you, in terms of reviewing your conduct. And you heard the kinds of expectations they have already just from their frontline experience. Well, when, you're getting it, when you take it to the next level and when you're going to be reviewed by the court, I'm not sure that it's going to be, uh, even, I think it's going to be an even higher expectation and, uh, and, and the objectives and the expectations are going to continue to be high. So I think on that note, I, as I say, I'm, I'm not going to get into uh, much on the exercise of discretion. It's in my paper and it's, uh, it's there to read and we can go from there. We'd much prefer to hear from Justice Kelly on his words of wisdom anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ian. With respect to trustee liability, if, if you ever want to get uh, a flavor, or if you want to get a flavor for where we are going in terms of claims against trustees, and Ian in his paper deals with exercise of discretion, let me just mention one example to you 
uh, case I'm dealing with right now, woman died about 15 years ago. She had uh, only one relative, a niece, and she had an estate of somewhere between two and three million dollars. She uh, left it entirely in trust for the niece, uh, named two senior lawyers in Ontario as the trustees, uh, and they had complete discretion as to any payments of income or capital to the niece until the niece became 40 years of age uh, and the niece was entitled to all the capital. The niece uh, over the years moved to the United States. She was in and out of a number of relationships. She was very regularly asking for large chunks of money, entering businesses that failed and whatnot. She and the trustees spent a great, great deal of time, I don't know what the compensation was, but a great deal of time assessing her various requests for income, for capital, and some they acceded to, others they refused, uh, but over time a fair amount was paid out. She turned uh, 40, I guess about 18 months ago or so, and at that time I think the estate had a value of about four million dollars, and she sued the trustees. Uh, I call the lawsuit, you should have known that I was an idiot uh, lawsuit, because she's suing the trustees saying that you knew that I wasn't responsible and fiscally uh, able to handle my affairs and you should not have acceded to my requests for capital which of course I've blown and the income that you paid to me and had you not given me any by this time this they even had uh, an economist not an actuary uh, do an evaluation indicating that the estate would now be worth something like 7.5 million dollars had they not encroached on income and capital so where this ends in terms of trustee liability, only one person can tell us, and that's Morris Cullody. Now, many of you know uh, Mr. Justice Cullody from the years that he toiled with the rest of us in the trenches of estate and trust law. Now, of course, he's joined the forces of darkness on the other side. And we thought that since he's had uh, two years in the Judicial Ivory Tower that we would be very much benefited by some of his judicial reflections in terms of what he's seen, not just cases, but uh, estate matters that he's uh, had some contact with in the period of time that he's been uh, sitting on the Superior Court of Justice. So we are very grateful to Mr. Justice Cullody for participating and uh, giving us of his time today, and I will turn things over to Mr. Justice Morris Cullody. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, I'm assuming that this thing is working. Is that right? Can you hear at the back, Mr. Hull? Uh, the topic I suggested actually was uh, a view from the far side with apologies to Gary Larson but uh, that was obviously too flippant and it's been changed by somebody to reflections from the other side and the reference to reflections is uh, just a dignified way of indicating that all I have to offer uh, is a fairly random selection of thoughts that have come to me over the last two years while I've been uh, handling the state's files more or less continuously. And uh, although it would be pretentious to call these thoughts insights, uh, most of them are things that I learned for the first time and some of them are things that I was surprised to learn. Uh, I hope you'll find some of them of interest. Uh, if you don't, uh, you can take comfort in the fact that it looks as though we're going to break early for um, <laughs> coffee this afternoon. Uh, in an attempt to, to provide what is probably a quite spurious sense of order, I've divided my comments into, under, put them under three headings. The first is the borderline between contentious and non-contentious matters, the borderline of estate litigation. The increasing availability of over-the-counter uh, orders and when you can get them and when you can't get them. And uh, I'm not going to say anything about when you can, you might be able to succeed in slipping them through even though you shouldn't get them. The second heading is uh, just a few comments on practical problems 
that I've seen for lawyers mainly in dealing with cases under the Substitute Decisions Act. And then finally, I, I want to make a few general and I hope not too pompous uh, comments about just how estate litigation looks, how it appears to be from the other side. Uh, the Law Society changed my topic, as I said, to reflections. Well, it's certainly not a, a mirror image. Uh, I certainly look at estate litigation now in a very different sense than, or a very different way than I used to. Well, first of all, the, the borderline between contentious and non-contentious matters. I'm told that uh, there are over 7,000 applications for uh, certificates of appointment of a state trustee that go to the estate's office every year. Most of those are dealt with by the staff at the estate's office and still a significant percentage get referred to judges. About uh, 35 a week, 35 files a week are referred to judges on the estates list. Now there are 47 judges on the estates list and I, I think I'm 42. I watch the list um, regularly to see when um, as I move up as Mr. Justice so-and-so has had another operation and has been removed from the estates list. Um, but I'm still at the stage where um, you generally can guess what the operation is too, but I'm still, at, I, I, I'm still at the stage where I get the hot potatoes rather than the plums. Um, on the other hand, I do see a lot of um, files that come across the desk. Now, of the, t of the 47, I believe the estates office regularly use about 12 judges uh, and uh, who they use is entirely up to them and it's a bit of a mystery I think as to why some files land uh, on your desk and why some, uh, some don't. Of the files that I see and sometimes I see up to about 15 a week, sometimes rarely do I go a week without seeing any, but of the files that I see about 10% get thrown back uh, either with a request for further information or with a direction to put the, the particular matter on the uh, motions list. Uh, most of the problems that we find in those files and, and many more of these problems are picked up actually by the uh, officials in the estates office and just in case I forget, I don't know whether you're aware, I know Brian is because Brian has been fighting this with all the vigor of which he's, he's renowned, but there has been recently a suggestion that the staff in the estates office be se severely reduced and that they be downgraded. Um, why anyone would possibly want to do this rather than upgrading them and increasing the number uh, is a complete mystery to me. And I can only assume that the people in the office of the ministry who are making these bureaucratic decisions have no idea of the work that they do. The, the staff there are actually doing judicial work. Of the file of the 7,000 applications that come in, they've got to be reviewed, they've got to be, make decisions whether the material is complete, they've got to make decisions whether there are problems that should be sent to a judge and to treat them as just clerical staff uh, I think is, is a, a, a terrible mistake. Anyway, the main problem that uh, arises with these files that come in and the files that are referred to us is simply that the file is not complete. There are omissions in the documents that are filed and this is terribly uh, terribly important. If you want to get orders over the counter and it doesn't matter what they are, the file must be complete. Too much information is, is not a problem. But so often, and it's, it's very common when we see them, that um, very common to find that the estates office have sent the files back to the solicitors or to the applicants several times asking for matters to be um, clarified. So if you want something dealt with quickly, it's very important to see that all the information is there. The most common cases, I think, are those where um, we're asked to make orders on consent and you read the will, because it's always there somewhere at the back of the file, and you find that there are people whose consent is necessary that simply um, uh, um, haven't consented. And in looking at those cases, 
you often have the feeling, you often wonder, why have these people consented? You get a passing of an, a, an unopposed passing of accounts in which the trustees have been passing accounts, accounts regularly over you know, every three years, and each time they're getting whacking big lumps of compensation, and each time everyone is consenting. And you wonder why are the beneficiaries consenting? And we don't have a, a practice here, there's no requirement in the rules that proof of independent legal advice uh, be supplied. We don't even have a requirement anymore that people file affidavits of execution. But uh, I've often wondered whether solicitors are not um, taking a risk. So solicitors acting for trustees, for example, in that passing of accounts case where they apply uh, to have the accounts passed. They apply on behalf of the executors for big lumps of compensation. They file um, consents from all the beneficiaries. And if they haven't taken care to see that the beneficiaries have given a properly informed consent, it, it occurs to me that there could be some exposure out there. I, certainly, it happens so often that there are, are an enormous number of um, a very high percentage of generous and grateful beneficiaries who are prepared to consent to uh, all sorts of things. The other case where you often wonder from the contents of the file whether people have been properly advised is where there are applications for the appointment of a state trustee without a will. Cases of intestacy and we get a statement, to the best of my knowledge the following people are the only people entitled to share in the estate. And there's absolutely no way you can tell from the file whether these are the next door neighbors, um, uh, members of the Toronto Maple Leafs hockey team or, or perhaps relatives. Um, again, I, I often wonder whether the solicitor acting on that file um, is, under, is aware that there could be some exposure if in fact the people swearing the affidavits have not been properly informed about the rules relating to intestacy and as you know it's possible even for experienced lawyers to make mistakes with the uh, interpretation of those rules. But sometimes there are more substantive omissions and the two most common, perhaps surprisingly common, are uh, where you get an application to grant a certificate with respect to a holograph will or a holograph codicil. And what you get is a piece of brown paper that has some scribbling on it like $10,000, Mary, $5,000, George, all my books as they see fit. And then you get a signature and you get this wonderful little abbreviated form affidavit that you find attached to the rules which says I so-and-so and doesn't say who so-and-so is. I'm familiar with the handwriting of the deceased and that's it. Sign so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, Quite commonly, I send those back. I say, I want to know whether this document does in fact represent the testamentary wishes, the fixed and final testamentary wishes of the deceased. It's not every piece of paper that's got some handwriting on it and some numbers and some people's names that uh, qualifies as a will. The fact that it's in the handwriting is not the only test. It's got to actually satisfy the requirements for a testamentary disposition. I had one just the other day. It was. Um, I changed my mind on it. There was, it was on a stationer's form. And I thought people had been educated not to do these things, but all the gaps were filled in. I appoint handwriting, so-and-so my exec, you tore, and so on. And then at the bottom it said, I give, I leave the following, um, I, I leave the following legacies. And then there were 10 things that made quite sense. Uh, quite an amount of sense. And then on the other side, it said, all the rest and residue of my estate. And then it says, in addition, I leave the following legacies. <laughs> and then at the bottom of it, it said, but if George so-and-so dies, full stop. And then over on, the, over on the next page, no witnesses, place for witnesses, and the signature. And there's $45,000 in the estate. 
Uh, virtually all of the beneficiaries are in England. One of them is alleged to be in Australia, but he's not answering um, <laughs> correspondence. And the thing lands on my desk uh, simply with an oh, it was an application to dispense with filing of a bond with respect to the $3,500, except with respect to the $3,500 that they were going to hold for the person in Australia. And uh, I initially wrote a big endorsement saying, I'm sorry, there's a big problem here. I don't even know whether this will is wholly in the handwriting of the deceased under the authorities. And uh, I'm afraid it's going to be expensive, but perhaps we could have a motion for directions. And initially, I will dispense with service on anyone and let you, you bring it ex parte. And um, then some way or another, we're going to have to deal with this. And uh, I signed the thing and came in the next morning and crossed it all out and uh, granted the order for dispensing with the bond except for $3,500 and granting probate. It just didn't seem to make sense. The, what was really pro troubling me was that, and I'm not up to date, I've, I, I, I no longer learn things or read things, I just listen to what counsel tell me. It's, wonder, it's, a, <laughs> it's a wonderfully lazy job. but. Um, <laughs> But there are problems, as I'll, I'll mention in a moment. But the, uh, the, the, when I last read the cases on this, there are cases out in the West that say that if you intended to incorporate the printed parts of the document as part of your will, then it's not wholly in your hand, own handwriting. And I think in, the, in Mac McDonald, Sheard and Hull, I think what they've suggested is that no, throw away the best test, the right test is throw away the printed stuff completely and then read the document. And if it's clear that it's intended to be a will and if the testamentary intention, if the intentions are clear, then grant probate. And I decided overnight, well, I think uh, Rodney and Ian Hull are correct on that, particularly as I wrote the particular part of the chapter in the second edition. <laughs> so. Um, I decided that it was ridiculous to, to send them into court and to spend $45,000 on, on getting the thing uh, probated. But the other, the other situation is even more um, strange. Uh, I, I mean, surprised how often solicitors try to get copies of wills probated. They just send in a copy and they say, we can't find the original. Would you please um, grant probate of it? And there's no reference at all to the you know, the problem of lost wills and the presumption of destruction with intention to revoke. And those I, I just send back and tell them to, put, to, to move for directions unless they can provide consents of all next of kin and beneficiaries under any prior wills. And that gives rise to a problem, and I think Rodney may have touched on this uh, this morning when he was dealing with Banton. Um, there's a big question mark in my mind, and it's about time that Ian Howell wrote a, an article on this, but big question mark in, in my mind is to what extent the abolition of the surrogate court rules and the application of the rules of civil procedure has changed the responsibilities of the court. You see, the old view always was that the judge was not just deciding a dispute between parties, the judge was making, giving a judgment in rem that bound the entire world as long as the probate was not revoked. So it's not just a case where um, the judgment binds the parties to it, it binds everybody. Um, under the new rules, it seems to me that th the process is becoming more adversarial. Now, Rodney talked about the Bainbridge case, which is a case that I am peculiarly inhibited from um, discussing because I drafted the will in, in it. Um, but the Bainbridge case, as Rodney mentioned, they applied the Rule 20, the rule um, allowing summary judgment. Well, the old rule, as I understood stand it, was that uh, anyone was entitled to demand that the executors pass the, prove the will in, in, in solemn form. And generally speaking, if you just cross-examine -exam and don't give evidence and don't get into a big fight, there's not a problem with costs. But the inquisitorial side of the jurisdiction and was recently referred to in, in, in a case in England where, where a judge refused to accept a, a settlement 
the parties said, all right, we've settled this, we agree, you should admit this will to probate. And the judge said, no, I've got to determine whether this is, for the whole world, whether this is the last will of the testator. Well, I think we're probably moving away from that here, as the Bainbridge case um, suggests. And uh, I don't see any harm if everybody consents. Uh, if, if, for example, there are three wills, and everybody consents that the last two are not the valid last will. I've got one of those at the moment. The last will, everyone is now saying, is void because there was no capacity. The second last will, everyone's saying, was a forgery. And uh, <laughs> everyone's happy to have the third, the, the earliest will, put to probate. Well, as long as everybody consents, I don't see any reason why anyone should be spending time and money uh, trying to work out whether, in fact, the second will was a, uh, a forgery. Now, the other situations where, which have a little bit more to do with the topic of the seminar than the ones I've just been talking about, the other situation where you have problems with over-the-counter applications is simply where you're not within the rules relating to over-the-counter applications. Section 74 and 70, sorry, rules 74 and 75 have a number of situations where it's clear, either explicitly as with um, applications for passings of, a, of accounts that are uncontested, or implicitly with applications for certificates of appointment of, of the state trustee, it's clear that it's intended you don't have to have a hearing and it can be done in writing across the, uh, across the counter. And Rule 37.12.1 allows motions in writing in certain cases where you've got a motion on consent or where the motion is unopposed if, if material is filed with the uh, uh, motion record uh, indicating that that's the case. And also motions where a hearing is not required. Um, sorry, motions ex parte, motions without notice. And that of course brings, would, would include all our motions for directions under Rule 74 and 75. But apart from applications for appointment of the state trustee and applications to pass accounts, I'm not aware, can't think at the moment, of any other applications that the rules say can be dealt with in writing. And that means applications to construe a will or applications to vary a trust technically, strictly, can't be dealt with over the, the counter even though everybody consents. And that, of course, I'd, I don't think makes any sense at all. And uh, when I was new and uh, um, enthusiastic, and before the first three months had passed and I became tired and jaded, um, I used to say, no, you can't. I can't give an order with respect to the construction of the will. This is an application. You can't do it. Um, as I say, it doesn't make sense, and if the, if the question is reasonably clear, and I don't feel that I need to hear submissions, uh, I now do that. I haven't yet approved a variation of a trust um, across the, the counter, but again, I don't see why it should, you shouldn't be able to do it. If the official guardian, sorry, the children's lawyer, and um, uh, all of the adult beneficiaries have consented, I would have thought an application to vary a trust is a precisely the kind of thing you should be able to do uh, across the counter. And uh, I have no doubt at all that there are many people here who could put up their hand and say, we've done it many times. Uh, generally speaking, I, I'm not really terribly impressed when people say, well, you can't throw that back. We've got that order before. Uh, that's like someone saying to Mr. Justice Wilkins, um, You've got to give damages for pain and suffering in an automobile insurance case because Justice Cullity did it last week. Uh, that wouldn't get very far with Mr. Justice Wilkins, and uh, I'm not terribly impressed if people have, without argument being um, um, made, people get orders that are not actually permitted by the uh, rules. Well, moving on to the uh, Substitute Decisions Act, the first week I sat in a state's motions court, I was amazed to find that more than half the motions were under the Substitute Decisions Act. And I think everybody here knows that these cases can raise horrendous problems for the lawyers and not just uh, for the litigants. And what has become increasingly clear to me, and this 
I suppose I was naive, I should have expected this, but it's become increasingly clear that Substitute a Decisions Act applications are being used to anticipate litigation about an estate after an incapable person's death. And uh, there are really two forms of, two situations that I've seen, more, more than one file in, in each situation. The first situation is where Someone, a member of the family, is frightened that mother or father is going to make another will. They like the will that's in place, so they move under the Substitute Decisions Act to have a, a guardian appointed. And in some of those cases, I've actually seen, and you know, I'm not, I'm not being critical here because it may make sound practical sense, but in some of those cases where the issue is, is there a capacity to manage property, and sometimes capacity with respect to the person too, but the experts are sometimes asked to give an opinion on testamentary capacity as well, even though that is not at all strictly relevant to the point in the proceedings. The other kind of case I've seen is uh, one where the um, particular person had become incapable, and the public guardian and trustee was appointed guardian. And another member of the family kicked up a bit of a fuss on the ground that a third member of the family had prevailed upon the in incapable person to transfer property uh, to her into vivos by way of gift. Public guardian and trustee brought proceedings to have the gift set aside on the ground of undue influence. The complainant then moved before Mr. Justice Sheard for an order appointing her uh, sorry, giving her leave to intervene as a party to the proceedings. Well, then there was a big trial, and the complainant, who was now inter an, an intervener, uh, was represented by counsel and prosecuted the action very, very vigorously indeed, even more vigorously, perhaps, than the public guardian and trustee. And there was a big trial, and then it went to the Court of Appeal, and then there was a, a new trial ordered. And eventually, the public guardian and the trustee, public guardian and trustee, and the defendant said, "We've reached a settlement." And the intervener said, "No way! I'm not agreeing to that. Um, the whole thing should be set aside. I'm not agreeing to a settlement." Well, because an, an incapable person was involved, the terms of the settlement had to be approved by a judge on on the incapable person's behalf, and Madam Justice Greer approved it on that basis, but leaving open the question whether the settlement was binding uh, if the intervener didn't consent. Well, that came to me and I held that um, the intervener uh, could not prevent the settlement taking place, even though the intervener was a, was a party. And then the question of costs came up and I decided that in the circumstances, given the participation of the intervener, that uh, she should get her costs out of the estate on a solicitor and client basis. But I couldn't find any cases on that area, in that area at all, but I suspect it is a kind of case which will recur. Uh, on the question of costs, I gave costs against the public guardian and trustee on one case where the office applied to have it, uh, the public guardian and trustee appointed t uh, guardian of the property and the person of a particular person. That particular person retained a lawyer and the thing was vigorously defended and I found that the public guardian and trustee hadn't discharged the burden of establishing incapacity. And then there was the question of costs and I gave costs again on party and party basis against the public guardian and trustee with considerable reluctance and considerable misgivings because the last thing one wants to do is to make it a an important consideration for that office when they're deciding whether to get involved in one of these cases, important consideration whether they're going to get their costs or have to pay costs at the end of the day. On the other hand, the person who they were trying to have the order made against had incurred cons very, very large legal fees fighting this thing, and it seemed to me that some order uh, for costs uh, should, be, um, should be given. Finally, under the uh, Substitute Decisions Act, there's a, a provision that I'm sure you're all aware of in <laughs> Section 3 that says if a person whose capacity is in question does not have a solicitor, is not represented, the public guardian and trustee can be ordered by the court to arrange legal representation and the allegedly incapable person is deemed to have capacity to instruct the lawyer. Well, that's fine, except it doesn't tell you 
what happens, what the lawyer's responsibilities are, if it's clear that the allegedly incapable person can't give instructions. I've had two cases like that quite recently, except two cases where a lawyer was retained. No order was made under Section 3. The lawyer was retained to act on behalf of the person whose capacity was in question. And then the lawyer came to court and first of all, they, they asked to have the file sealed, and I, I did seal it, although we're not supposed to do that sort of thing, uh, lightly. But the, 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 I can't really talk about it, can I? Um, <laughs> I talk, I'll, talk complete, I'll talk completely generally. In a couple of cases, I have allowed lawyers, I have allowed lawyers to get off the record in that situation. Um, and I, in the Banton case, I made a, an obita comment, and I love the concept these days, the concept of obita dicta, because <laughs> it means you can change your mind. Uh, I like it almost as much as the concept of balance of probabilities, without which no decision would ever be made in a civil case, as far as I'm concerned. But um, in the Banton case, I said obita that I thought that um, lawyers had a duty to get off the record if they couldn't take instructions. And Professor Oosterhoff, in a commentary that Madam Justice Greer showed me on the Bannon decision, said this was altogether too strict and that the lawyer should stay there as a sort of amicus curiae. And uh, um, again, as I say, one of the wonderful things about over the dicta is that you can change your mind. So I delivered reasons on a further Banton case that's going on and a further stage of the Banton case in which I, I recanted and said, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it's an open question because Professor Oosterhoff's views, like all academics' uh, views, uh, are worthy of the utmost respect. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't know. I, frankly, I don't know what the position is. I, I can't believe, uh, certainly if you're not appointed under Section 3 by, as a result of a court order, uh, the lawyer can't be automatically turned into a litigation guardian with power to make decisions on behalf of the allegedly incapable person. Apart from anything else, litigation guardians under the rules uh, have to sign a document saying that they are aware that they uh, assume, may, as may, uh, may incur a personal liability for costs. And I think if that was the, the situation, very few people would be acting in that, in the, in that situation. Um, it, but it may be that uh, you stay there as an amicus curiae and, and assist the court, but it seems to me that the practical problems of trying to work out how much, to what extent you have to be involved, to what extent you have to try to communicate with this person whom you decided can't instruct you, um, is pretty difficult. Well, now finally, two comments on the conduct of the state uh, litigation, and these are the comments that I said, I hope you won't, unlike my other comments, you won't find too pompous. Uh, the first one is that it's very evident to me that the attitude of solicitors and counsel in a state litig litigation matters ha has changed and is changing increasingly towards acceptance of a role that sees the lawyer as having the responsibility to assist the clients to settle. Um, when I started practicing 20 years ago in this area, the attitude was extremely different. Uh, I'll never forget, I was, I must have been in the office for uh, six weeks or something, and I got a phone call one day from a lawyer, and I've never met him, and I've never forgotten his name. But what he said to me was, Mr. Cullody, I've received your name from somebody or, or other. Um, my message to you is, the fruit has ripened on the bough, and it is about to fall into our laps. And I didn't have the faintest idea what he was talking about. <laughs> but it turned out he had found an ambiguity, an inconsistency, an obscurity in a will, and we were all rushing off to court to have it interpreted, and he wasn't in the slightest bit, in fact, he wasn't the slightest bit embarrassed. He seemed rather proud of the fact that he was the lawyer who drafted the will. <laughs> um, and. In years ago, there was another, there was another lawyer, another lawyer very experienced in estate matters, uh, someone we all know and love very much, who used to phone me up late at night and say, "Colody, we've got a live one." Um, 
it seems that that, that, that attitude seems to me to uh, be, be going out the board. Occasionally you get a file now where you can tell from the multiplicity of motions and the delays and the tone of the correspondence and the bickering in court when it gets there that you've got two litigants, two counsel of the old school for whom the adversarial game is worth playing for its own sake, confident that at the end of the day everybody's going to get their costs out of the estate on a sister and client basis. Well, that's an approach that's outmoded and uh, I think misguided and uh, I, I'm really quite impressed by the, how it is evident that lawyers are trying to get settlements. It's not as evident in the estates field as it is in the family law field. In the family law field, I, I think over 90% of cases are settled without going to trial. They have a, 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 a strange practice there, it's almost certainly this, this being uh, recorded well. They have a practice there that says you can't go to court unless you have a, 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 a case conference before a judge. And what's more, they say, if it's not settled at the case conference, that judge will hear the motion in court. <laughs> and th they settle uh, this large percentage and um, what impressed me when I, when I was there for a glorious three months was to see how counsel, and of course there's a specialist bar which makes all the difference, how counsel were actually accepting the fact that their responsibility was to use their powers of advocacy on their own clients. You know, the lawyers, the lawyers were, the lawyers knew each other, they were all specialists, they knew exactly where they were going to end up, what the range would be, so there'd be a little bit of sort of fancy footwork at the, uh, or tap dancing at the um, case conference. And then they'd come to an agreement as to a range, and then they'd go off and they'd sell it to their clients. And the system works. Now whether it'll work as well, if it can work in family law, surely it can work in uh, estate, uh, estate uh, litigation. And I think we're moving in that, that direction. And then my final comment, and I've managed to extend this uh, to almost three o'clock. My final comment, um, you'll probably think, is just the rantings of a, a rapidly aging uh, former pedagogue. That's, uh, that's what I think is the deterioration in the quality of legal research. Um, and I have to say very quickly that this is a comment, really, that I would direct at civil litigation generally rather than the state litigation in particular. Um, it, it's bothered me a lot, uh, but I'm quite certain that one of the reasons for this is, what, you know, when I say this, I mean you, the relevant cases are not cited. Um, inconsistent cases on one side, you know, cases on one side that would exclude the cases on the other side are not cited. And we have a generalist judiciary. There's no attempt to stream. Works in family law. The family law judges, like Mr. Justice Walsh and Mr. Justice O'Connell, are specialists. But generally speaking, there's no attempt to stream. So I, you know, I was horrified in my first week in pre-trials to go in, and there was a lawyer from Thompson Rogers and someone from Kosky and Minsky, and they said, now this is a very nasty accident, but we've agreed on liability. We'd just like to have your views on damages. And I said, excuse me, and uh, went next door and uh, got my brother Ravard to change um, courtrooms uh, with me. <laughs> but it's, uh, it, it's, it's not, a, I mean, it's a generalist bench, and therefore we're not just dependent on counsel, we're at the mercy of counsel. And um, with the proliferation of reports, specialist reports, and the availability of virtually everything in quick law online, what's happening is that even though the interested parties will say, well, now research is made easy, you have all these cases at your fingertips. Well, you've got 300 cases at your fingertips, but no way of knowing in advance which of the 300 is the single case that is any good or any useful at all unless you sit down and read them. And you haven't got time to read them and counsel are not taking the time to do it. And you can't expect them to because time is money and research is becoming expensive. I saw this before I, I left practice in the tax area. You'd be looking at section, subsection 75.2 of the Income Tax Act 
and you'd say to the student in the next office, get me everything from Revenue Canada on section 75.2, and 20 minutes later they'd come in with a stack of paper that, and I'm not exaggerating, that thick, and you'd wade through it, it would take you an hour or so, and none of it would be, it was all on section 75.2, but none of it would help you. What's happening, I'm sure, is that council now say, well, this looks good enough, you know, it's a case that seems to support me. They don't do a comprehensive um, um, review and it's, it doesn't bother me so much in this area because I've had some background in this area, but in other areas you really feel, you know, quite vulnerable and uh, very embarrassed and uh, quite irritated when in a subsequent case you are handed a book of authorities and you find all the authorities that should have been cited to you in the previous case that you've already d um, decided and unfortunately someone has decided uh, is worth uh, reporting. That problem is not going to get... <laughs> <coughs> that, that problem is not going to go away um, while we still have a, while we have a generalist bench. It's simply not going to go away. I think it's going to proliferate inconsistent decisions are definitely proliferating. Um, what I would like to see happen, and I mentioned this to Rodney Howell this morning, what I'd like to see happen is the system they have in some United States jurisdictions where if you're not happy, if you're not satisfied that you've heard fully researched, developed arguments, you make the decision on the basis of what you've heard and then you've got a rubber stamp and you stamp on the bottom of it, this case not to be used as a precedent. And they... <laughs> That, that is actually in force, and you know, it doesn't make much, it doesn't make a, I don't think it, uh, it, it, it's necessarily a, a stupid um, uh, rule if you consider the problem, and if you accept that the problem is a real problem. Anyway, when I mentioned this to Rodney this morning, he said, uh, it's simply not necessary in your case, Cullody, everybody takes that for granted. <laughs> I thank both of our speakers, uh, Ian Hall and Mr. Justice Cullity, and we will now uh, break until 3.15, and then we will have uh, two more speakers, and we'll be adjourning somewhere between 4 and 4.15.